It's an object like no other object, not so much a building as a thing. A thing like a pyramid or a druid's altar. An object of almost ancient reverence, a gesture towards the infinite like St. Peter's. Yet its gothic arches point up to no god, only to an ideal of functional excellence. Unfinished, it'll cost 50 million pounds. It was hailed by world architects as a turning point, a new dimension. The most unified big work of art ever designed. And yet, it's a failure. An appalling fiasco. A four and a half acre, 220 foot high scandal. An Antipodean Tower of Babel. The centre of a nation's debate on how much art is worth and the greatest continuing local joke on record. Big white sails, a full wind, and nowhere to go. The Sydney Opera House, product of a people who had a genial bash at culture, and then went back to their beer. In a land where there's always a king tide running and a summer forever to spend on the beach, in a Pepsi-Cola culture, a gentler Texas of the South Seas, where the rough idealism of the bush anthem of the fathers is a far cry from the virile materialism of the sons, where history is regarded as a European luxury and culture a distraction from the serious business of pleasure, where noble headlands submerge under seas of red bungalows. It seems a bit odd that the people should perform a cultural act of faith and build an opera house and they had nothing to put in it. How did it happen here? Australians believe that they have a kind of give-it-a-go quality, that there's something rather thoughtless about us. We like to kind of plunge into an action without thinking about it very much. And I think that that certainly is true of the Opera House. It was something that was just kind of bundled together. Sir Eugene Goosens, the conductor, suggested it first. He vastly improved the Sydney Symphony Orchestra and wanted a big, permanent auditorium for its performances. He asked the New South Wales Premier, Joseph Carl, a former railway employee, for a dual-purpose concert hall and opera house. The Premier rather liked the idea of opera, probably just a vague, wishy-washy cultural idea who may have thought of suburban daughters improving themselves, something of that kind. Carl was the sort of politician that we've encountered only too rarely in Australia. For one thing, he was a superb political manipulator or operator. However, unlike a large number of other political operators, he wasn't content just with power for its own sake. He was genuinely concerned to try and improve the quality of life uh, in the state of New South Wales. Somehow, in spite of its brilliant location, Sydney in the 50s still managed to look dowdy. Neville Cardis called it Manchester by the sea. Carl felt it needed a focal point for its increasing wealth and sophistication. 